Why did Antony Flew recant his atheism? A Google search will bring up a load of reasons, ranging from abuse, to abstraction, and everything in between. To find out the real issue, let us hear the man himself, as he talks to Joan Bakewell on BBC Radio 4, on the 22nd of March, 2005. Professor Flew, good morning. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Do you think it's acceptable that you can teach this subject intelligence design in science classes? Well, the crucial thing which no one seems to have noticed is that uh, Darwin's theory uh, was a theory of the evolution of species. Uh, but as he himself uh, pointed out in the 14th chapter of The Origin of Species, the whole business of evolution had to begin uh, with a he didn't put it in exactly these words, a creature, an animal, that was capable of reproducing genetically. Now, I believe myself that there are signs of intelligent design. The distinction that needs to be made is the theory of the origin of species, uh, which of course has difficulties, but is, is overwhelmingly concerned. And the thing which shows intelligence design is the development from um, inanimate matter to living matter to the very, very big step of producing a creature capable of, of reproduction. Okay, let's now summarize what Professor Flew said. He said the thing which shows intelligent design is the development from inanimate matter to living matter to the very, very big step of producing a creature capable of reproduction. The alternate view is abiogenesis. By this, they refer to the hypothesis that living organisms arise naturally from non-living matter as natural random processes work on them over vast periods of time. Here are the two options. You may be thinking, wait a minute. Didn't Thomas Huxley clarify this over a hundred years ago, where he whipped Samuel Wilberforce in a debate? Not so fast. We need to separate fact from fiction from this urban legend. First, it was not a formal debate, as it was a discussion following a paper presentation by John William Draper. Four people spoke. Wilberforce spoke for about 30 minutes followed by Huxley, Robert Fitzroy, and Joseph Hooker. Journalists covering the event did not report the fancy story of Huxley's put-down of Wilberforce. Wilberforce, Huxley and Hooker were all under the impression that they had won. Contrary to popular misinformation, Wilberforce's objections were actually based on science. So, what was it that happened? During the time given to him, Wilberforce presented his objections. His objections to Darwin's theory had been published earlier in the Quarterly Review. Darwin endorsed the substance of Wilberforce's objections by saying, It is uncommonly clever, it picks out with skill all the most conjectural parts, and brings forward well, all the difficulties. So, on one side, we have a clever, insightful, scientific critique. Whereas Huxley, on the other hand, is remembered for his now well-known argument, that six eternal monkeys, or apes, typing on six eternal typewriters, with unlimited amounts of paper and ink, could, given enough time, produce a psalm, a Shakespearean sonnet, or even a whole book, purely by chance, that is, by random striking of the keys. In the course of his presentation, Huxley pretended to find the 23rd Psalm among the reams of written gibberish produced by his six imaginary apes at their typewriters. He went on to make his point that, in the same way, molecular movement, given enough time and matter, could produce Wilberforce himself purely by chance, and without the work of any designer or creator. Let us see if Huxley's math really adds up. The time taken on the average to correctly type the whole of the 23rd Psalm, made up of 603 letters, verse numbers, punctuation and spaces, would be 50 to the power 603 divided by 31,536,000, which is 9.552 multiplied by 10 to the power 1016 years. If the letter B stands for billion, that is 10 to the power 9, this number could be written like this. By comparison, the evolutionist age of the universe is only almost 15 billion years. Poor Huxley's math was off. 
but then he was also clueless about the complexity of DNA, otherwise he would not have floated a simplistic analogy like monkeys on typewriters. The late Sir Fred Hoyle, who was professor of astronomy at Cambridge University, gave a more appropriate analogy. He said, now imagine 10 to the power 50 blind persons, that is 100,000 billion 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 people, standing shoulder to shoulder, they would more than fill our entire planetary system, each with a scrambled Rubik cube and try to conceive of the chance of them all simultaneously arriving at the solved form. You then have the chance of arriving by random shuffling, random variation, of just one of the many biopolymers on which life depends. The notion that not only the biopolymers but the operating program of a living cell could be arrived at by chance in a primordial soup here on Earth, is evidently nonsense of a high order. Another of Professor Hoyle's very expressive analogies is that the chance that even the simplest self-reproducing life forms might have emerged in this way, that is, by evolutionary processes, is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. Hoyle noted that even if the whole universe consisted of organic soup from which life is made, the chance of producing the basic enzymes of life by random processes without intelligent direction would be approximately 1 in 10 with 40,000 zeros after it. The impossibility of that number can be seen in the following illustration. The likelihood of reaching out and by chance plucking a particular atom out of the universe would be about 1 in 10 with 80 zeros after it. If every atom in this universe became another universe, the chance of reaching out at random and plucking a particular atom out of all of these universes would be 1 in 10 with 160 zeros after it. Hoyle accuses the evolutionists of self-interest, unfair pressure, and dishonesty. This mathematical impossibility is well known to geneticists and yet nobody seems to blow the whistle decisively on the theory because of its grip on the educational system you either have to believe the concepts, or you will be branded a heretic. We saw earlier that even a short psalm like Psalm 23 could not have come by chance. How could something phenomenally more complex have come about? Bill Gates defines the code in the DNA like this. Human DNA is like a computer program but far far more advanced than any software ever created. Francis Collins describes the complexity like this. The human genome consists of all the DNA of our species, the hereditary code of life. The newly revealed text was three billion letters long, and written in a strange and cryptographic four-letter code. Such is the amazing complexity of the information carried within each cell of the human body, that a live reading of that code at a rate of one letter per second would take 31 years even if reading continued day and night. Printing these letters out in regular font size on normal bond paper and binding them all together would result in a tower the height of the Washington Monument. Now let us back up a bit, to Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew came to see this, and as a scientist, he followed the facts to its conclusion and acknowledged that there has to be a creator behind this amazing design. It is impossible for life to come out of non-life without intelligent intervention, and he was honest enough to acknowledge it.